the gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, that Jesus died on the cross, and that was for your sins and my sins and everyone who believes sins. Past, present, and future, you are signed and sealed. He was buried, and then he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Believe now. Um, I felt compelled to tell a couple of miracles because when people tell me different things, you know, it gets me thinking like everybody else. You know, I uh, start questioning my salvation and then I have to think of the miracles that have happened to me since I believe this gospel. <clears throat> um, I gave my testimony on Amy's channel. But not many people know the whole story. You know, there's a whole story to it. It's almost like my life has been a mission in jails and rehabs and places like that because I always had like 10 or 12 people with me teaching them Revelation because I've been learning eschatology and watching since, gosh, now 17 years. It's been a long time. Even after I got saved, some things were taken immediately. But then there were some things that just lingered. And two things that lingered was addiction and alcoholism. And I prayed, man. Y'all don't know how hard I prayed for those things to be taken away. And if you've never had an addiction or been an alcoholic, like a true alcoholic. Not somebody who has a drinking problem. But an alcoholic that... That's all they think about. It's an obsession. You can't stop it. It carries you places you don't want to go and you don't even want to drink, but you have to. That'll go into my second story, but I wanted to tell two stories of miracles. One happened while I was in addiction and alcoholism. And the other one happened when I went to Arkansas. These are things that are completely out of my control. There's nothing I can do about it. I was staying with a friend because I had started back drinking and my mom, she won't let me come around when I'm drinking. So I had nowhere to stay, so I was staying with him, and he was staying in a camper behind his mom's house. He had a bad meth problem, and meth wasn't my thing. I'd seen it taking too many people. I was already dealing with my own problems by that point. Uh, the addiction was coming and going, and the alcoholism had me. Even when I quit, the whole three or six months, however long I went, I was thinking about it all the time. I couldn't stop like the people that know me know that it got so bad I was drinking hand sanitizer. I, I could not control it. So I'm over at this guy's house. He's running out of meth. And then his phone rings. It's like magic. This dealer says, hey, come over and I'll give you a 20. And he said, yeah, I'll come over. And so he's like, we're fitting to go over there. And I said, D don't you think it's a bad idea? I mean, that dude called you. I've never had a dealer call me and say, hey, come over. Never, ever. And I was, you know, I was living homeless behind a Walmart shooting heroin. So I'm, I know how dealers are. But anyway, against my better judgment, I got in the car with him and was riding with him to be honest i was kind of worried about him he'd been up a long time he was seeing things he thought he had bugs in his toenails and he was digging at his toenails with a knife and like i say i'd been drinking i don't have a driver's license so he had to drive so we get in this car we take off all right, he's acting crazy. I'm so glad when we get there. And it's an apartment complex. And he goes up and he goes in. 
and he's in there forever, man. I'm in my phone because I'd gotten a virus on my phone. I was trying to get it off. I'd opened the link that was sent to me on Facebook. That's the reason I don't use Messenger much. But anyway, that's another story. So we get there. He finally comes out. When he comes out, he's got a bottle of palm olive and he's got a bottle of or a jar of peanut butter. He's eating the peanut butter with his fingers. We get in the car. He's still eating peanut butter with his fingers. Now we're driving. We pull out of the apartment complex, start going down the road. As soon as we start going down the road, blue lights come on. He says, oh my gosh, it's the drug agents. And I said, yeah, no, like, no crap. So he takes this meth, this 20 bag of meth, which is about, I don't know, about that big. It's about that big. So he throws it in my lap. I have nothing to drink. I've never, you know, done meth like that. I tried it one time, but I've never, like, done a whole 20. But it's in a bag, so since I've had gastric bypass, I'm hoping that it'll go through. But I can't find anything to drink, and now he's throwing it in my lap. The cops are walking up. So I stick it in my mouth. Like, right, right, right. They always search your mouth. I knew they would, but I was hoping I'd get a chance to swallow it. We get out, and they start making a strip down. I strip down to my underwear, and because I've got so much skin, because I used to be almost 500 pounds, I was 472 pounds when I had the gastric bypass. Now I'm about 250. So I lost a lot of weight. He said, That's, it looks like you've been on meth. And I said, no, sir, I'm a drunk. And I said, I mean, by that point, everybody knew anyway. My brother-in-law worked for the sheriff's department, and um, my mom used to send him to arrest me to stop me from drinking. So that's a lot of the reason I've been arrested so many times, if anyone wants to know, because I've been judged a lot for it. But people don't know the whole story. No one ever does. They haven't walked in your shoes. Remember that. When people judge you, they haven't walked in your shoes. All right, so back to the story. They're searching us. I look at him. He's still, they're not, they've kind of backed off of him, and he's digging at his toenails with that knife again. And I told the cop, I said, man, he don't need to go to jail. He needs a doctor. I mean, he, he seriously needs help. And he said, oh, we're going to give him some help. Well, see, he had done prison time, and he was on felony probation and parole and because he had gotten another charge, and he had a lot of history. So they take us both to the sheriff's department. They never look in my mouth. This whole time when they were searching us, it was almost like it went into bullet time, like in the Matrix where everything's slow. And I can't explain it, but it's like it wasn't real. I don't know how to explain it. I could tell something was different. I could tell something was there, if that makes sense. I don't know if y'all have ever experienced anything like that. They had the dog out there. The dog was searching us and searching the car, and they couldn't find anything. They knew he just bought it. They knew it. They knew we had it. They tore the car apart, tore it apart, searching. And they knew we had it. So they asked me, will you go with us to the sheriff's department, to the drug office, and um, we'll talk to you there. And would you give us a urine sample? And I said, yeah, I will. You know, I'm being cooperative because that's how you have to be. If you've never dealt with law enforcement, you don't understand how it works. They're all Masons, man. If law enforcement really worked like it's supposed to work, it would be awesome. But there's too many people that are angry, that want power, 
they love having power over others. Anyone that's been in jail for any amount of time has seen that out of these guards. But anyway, they take us to the drug office. I'm still saying I'll give them some urine. I said, well, I can't pee right now. I said, is there any way y'all could get me some water? And I'll drink some water and then I'll pee for you. Anyway, they bring me some water. They bring me some little cone cups. Two of them. And I take them. And I said, thank you. He said, I'll be back in a minute. And I said, all right. There's a camera up in the corner. There's a camera over here. They got me on camera everywhere. This is still in my mouth. I move it over with my tongue. And I take the first water and I start drinking. It's starting to get caught, man. I take the second water. And it goes down. What I'm hoping is it's in a bag with gastric bypass. It'll just go through so I don't have a stomach like other people. Well, they come back and they start interviewing me and they want to know who I know and all this stuff. And I really didn't know anybody. I'd been living in Nashville, Tennessee for years, so I'd done lost contact with everybody. Everybody already knew I had a problem, so nobody really wanted me around. So they interviewed me. They found out I knew nothing, and then they wanted me to pee. Then I told them I've changed my mind. Because, see, the thing is, when you're in that situation, if you urinate for them, they can charge you with everything in your urine. And I had other stuff in my urine. So I'm not going to play that game. I just said that to get there to get me some time, hoping I could swallow this thing or get rid of it or something. Oh, I start feeling a little funny. Not in a good way. It was really, like, really anxious. And they were in in the interview, and they said, okay, you can go. The more anxious I got, you know, as this goes on. And I start walking across the street, and across the street is the Georgia State Patrol um, post. And where they do driver's license and all that stuff. So I walk over there and I get behind there. They've had my cell phone, but the lock was on there and I didn't have to unlock it for them. I wasn't on probation at the time. But I'm still like paranoid now because this stuff is kicking in really hard. Now I'm paranoid that they're watching me or they've put something in my phone. So I break my phone. And then I start going through the woods. The further I got, the worse it got, man. Oh, man, it got bad. I found this uh, place that was a Georgia power, um, like, power station. And I laid down behind it because it had some clean concrete. And I laid down behind it and just sat there and hoping it would pass, hoping it would pass, man. Well, I walked and walked and walked. The sun's coming up by this point. I don't know what that is doing with William. The sun, he's deceased now. The sun's coming up. And there's this little um, gas station there. And it's run, all our gas stations back home in Valdosta are run by Indian families. Um, there's like a doctor that bought several and he puts family members in it. And that's just the way it is. You know, they're cool people. They've always been nice to me. So I stop and I go in there. And I'm looking rough because I'm withdrawing off alcohol and I'm high on meth. Wow. Mm. Not a good combination at all. At all. So I told him, can I please use your bathroom? And he said, yes. Went in the bathroom, turned on the water, washed my face. Wash my hands. Um, you know, straightened up my hair. Because I used to, I never grew my beard out before in my life. I want to grow it out and see how long it gets before Jesus gets here. I don't want to cut it before Jesus gets here. And so I hope I don't end up like ZZ Top waiting. I think he's coming any minute. But anyway, 
the guy said, hey, are you hungry or thirsty? He said, get you a sausage dog and get you a drink. So I did. And I sat down and I ate it. Because um, I'm kind of weird. I used to be on Adderall when I was young for ADHD. So it used to put me to sleep. They had to put me on a high dose before it even worked. And then, you know, I could always eat on it. So I ate the hot dog and drank the drink, took the drink with me and kept on walking. I'm still paranoid. I'm paranoid they're watching me. I walked about three miles to the truck stop, got to the truck stop, asked a trucker to use his cell phone and they called my mom to come get me. Later on, it's like, I don't know, a month later, I get a message on Messenger from this guy, William. And he said, man, that was gangster. No, it was God. <laughs> it, was, it was pure Jesus. It was, there was an angel there or Jesus was there. The Holy Spirit did it. Whatever did it, it was, it was definitely a God moment. That was proof that I knew the right gospel to me. All right. Why isn't this gospel taking this away? I kept asking myself. And I kept reminding myself of sanctification that surely that would be part of it too. These little bugs keep landing on me. They're driving me crazy. So, time goes on. I go back to Nashville and then 2020 happened. And at the end of 2020, I moved back to Valdosta and I was stuck in a bedroom for like two years. I, this leads into the second story. This is the story of how I got to Arkansas. This is what I'm going to court for. People don't know the history of my life. I used to pray that God would please not take my mother out of my life until he put someone in my life that loved me like she did. So either way, whether you send me somebody or you keep my mom alive to the rapture, either way, just please. You know, you never really know a person, I guess. Is all I can figure. I mean, that's I have to reconcile it some way in my head, you know. You've got to reconcile it or you can't forgive. I knew my mom was tired of my addiction and my alcoholism. I knew she was. I thought that no one could love me like she did and no one tells me the truth and see I was brought up to lie I was brought up in a situation where it was always don't tell so and so this or tell so and so this or always some little, little lie some manipulation That's the reason when I share the gospel, I do it in a conversational way. You know, it comes up in conversation, and then I go into the gospel and explain it. Because I'm good at conversation. I don't just run up and give a track and try to convert people. And anyone trying to convert me, I've got proof. Here comes the second miracle that I think about. And there's a bunch of them, but these are two big, big, big ones that other people know about. And I have to remind myself of this one. All right. I would go like three or six months and not drink anything. And, you know, the whole time I'm thinking about it, but I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it because I know that I have nowhere else to go and she don't like it. I didn't know that I was that much of a burden being there. I really didn't. I 
I had no idea that she wanted me to leave. I knew that she was tired of certain things, but I had no idea she wanted me to leave. Well, see, me and Samantha have been talking for a long, 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 long time. We met because her husband committed suicide. My wife committed suicide. But mine was a long time ago. Hers was two years ago. But... Anyway, we connected on that point and started talking, and everything just evolved. We became best friends, really. You know, if you talk long enough, you get to know a person, if that makes sense, because you can't hide it, especially in text and messenger form. You can't hide it for years, if that makes sense. You could tell if they went back on something. But... That night, I decided to drink, and I bought enough so I could get a little buzz and go to sleep because I, I my drinking was driven by anxiety problems, too. So anyway, I would bought enough where I could get a little buzz and go to sleep and then have enough for when I woke up and felt bad to kind of wean myself off of it. Well, she come in, and she could tell that I'd been drinking. I guess she smelled it. I don't know how she could tell. So she starts reaching up under me and trying to get the bottle, and I wake up because I was asleep. I wake up, and she's trying to get the bottle. I'm trying to stop her. She's like, no, take that. no, because I knew I needed it to come off of it. That's the reason I had it. That was my justification. And so anyway, she got it and she poured it out. So then it became, of course, a yelling match. I tried to get away from her and I went in the bathroom. She was taking the doorknob off and come in. She's in there and when she's mad, she's like no other. I mean, there's no stopping her. She's slapping you, hitting you with stuff, trying to destroy your feelings. I mean, she's really got a redhead's temper. So anyway, I'm trying to get away from her. So I push by her. She falls in the bathtub. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Anyway, I have to help her up. Then I'm trying to get away from her. All right, she calls 911. And I said, Mama, please don't call the cops. You know what's going to happen, please. And I'm begging her not to. All right. I hang up her phone. She calls 911 again. The cops come over. Well, see, she called 911 all the time because my little sister would throw a fit and she'd call 911. That happened a lot. And it had happened a lot with the drinking, too. I have dealt with this cop so many times. Me and him do not get along. When I was out at the road smoking a cigarette, he would stop me and ask me questions. and He just is one of those who thinks that they just have authority over everybody. The way he comes and he tells my mom, I can't come every time to run your family. Wasn't this time, but the last time he did. So he comes in and mama tells him that she does not want me to come back. Ever. Well, he comes up and he says something. I don't remember what he said. Me and him got in a yelling match. I do not like cops and I do not like this guy. And I was drinking, so I was very open with him. If that makes sense. He puts cuffs on me. And I leave. They take me and put me in the car. We get in the car. And he takes two Kratom shots. And I said, really? You've got a gun on your side. You're driving a car. You've put me in cuffs. And you're taking drugs. And you're taking me to jail for drinking. Okay. I let him have it the whole way to jail. And then we get to the jail. We get in the hold and he's writing out the report. And I'm just yelling at him. Just yelling at him. Yelling at him. Yelling at him. Would not stop. Even to the point I was. I mean I, I was not me. I was smiling in my mug shot. Because I thought it was BS. You know. We got in an argument. She fell in the tub. I didn't push her in the tub on purpose. She fell in the tub and I was trying to get away from her. She was slapping me. 
Anyone would. You can't take that without losing it. So, um, he writes a report. I find out that I've been charged with interfering with a 911 call because I took the phone and hung it up. And I'm guilty of that. And then, um, family violence because my little sister was there. And she, they say she witnessed it. Well, anyway, they write their reports and everything, and I'm charged with that. Two misdemeanors. I go to jail. My bond ain't that much because two misdemeanors ain't that bad, you know. So... I go to jail. About two days later, they come and get me and say, we got to take you up to booking. And I was like, for what? You got a new charge. A new charge? For what? They wouldn't tell me. They take me up to booking. I find out it's a felony. Intimidation of the elderly. So anyway, now I've got a felony charge. My bond just went up considerably. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I kind of hid from everybody for a long time. And then Sam found me. And I called her. And I spent about a month in jail. We was trying to figure out how to get me out. But I didn't have anywhere to go. And we was trying to find me somewhere to go. I spent about a month in jail. It was, it was getting bad then. That was two years ago. Like they were serving like eggs with, they cooked their eggs in water, and they were serving them eggs sandwiches, and they had water all in them every day. It was bad. I sat in there a month, but. I, all I had was all these gospel tracts to read and then the Bible. And, you know, I told everybody about the gospel. I, I really did. I shared the gospel with everybody. I believe one guy really got it. So it wasn't a wasted trip. But during the trip, like, Sam was talking to me every day. She kept me going. She was a true friend, man. Because during that time, I didn't know it, but Watchman Adam... And my mom were working behind the scenes trying to keep me from getting out. They both denied, of course, but uh, they were caught. I mean, there's no denying it. The proof is there. Well, towards the end of that month, I got off the phone with Sam. And we had just found out that they were going to do a GoFundMe to try to get me out. And I was going to go to Arkansas, and she was going to help me find somewhere to go from here. So I had nowhere to go. I got off the phone, and I was walking back to my cell, and I look over at the time clock, and it says 2-2-2-2, 22 seconds. And I was like, wow, that was weird. Because I'm not really a numbers guy, but that was weird. That I mean, that I, I was like, okay, what are you telling me? So anyway, I get back on the phone. I call Sam. I said, "What does two 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 mean? <laughs> you know what? What would a bunch of twos mean?" She looked it up. At first, she didn't tell me what the first meaning was. She told me what the second meaning was. I can't remember what it was, but I couldn't find out anything about it because I don't have a computer. I'm in jail. Well, then. I went back to the cell and somebody knew what it was and they told me it's marriage. I was like, marriage? What? Because <laughs> I was not looking for marriage. So I called her back. I said, um, one of my cellies said that it stands for marriage. She said, yeah, that was, that was the definition that was the first one. <laughs> and I'm like, oh gosh. So we get off the phone and I go lay in the cot and I'm like, oh my goodness, Jesus, what are you doing? <sighs> anyway, they do the GoFundMe and in like two days they raise the money to get me out, get me a motel, get me a bus ride, get me out to Arkansas. It was a miracle.
And to that point, Watchman Adam and my mom were still trying to keep me from getting out. I didn't have anyone to pick me up and take me to the motel so I could get a lift to catch a bus the next day. And my whole family lives in that town. <laughs> that's, that's, that's crazy to me. It's like, it breaks my heart that I know Jesus and no one can tell me any different. There's no way to convert me in any way. I see the miracles. No one would come get me. I'm talking about it's five miles. And then my mom's working to keep me from getting out. She could have set up somebody to come get me. It was all on Sam. Well, my friend Bonnie decided to come get me. Her whole family was like against it. You're not going to pick up a guy in jail. Well, me and Bonnie had met before face to face. We went and eat together before. We've talked on the phone and on the computer forever. I've known her for a long time. She went against her whole family and she come and got me, picked me up. I got bonded out. The bond guy was really nice. When they released me, I was in nothing but my boxers. I would bought a shirt in there, but it said Georgia Department of Corrections. I bought it for a couple of bags of potato chips. And they said I couldn't wear it because they'd think I was escaped. And I said, no one's going to think I escaped because nobody escaped. And I've got my bond paperwork. Anyway, they made me leave in my boxers. So, the bond guy was so cool. And then Bonnie showed up. She had went and got my stuff from my mother. That was a big issue, too. I needed my phone. I needed all my clothes. She got there and took me to the motel and gave me the money that Sam had sent. I got in the motel and I'll t I'm telling you all the whole story. I'm not going to leave anything out. I got to the motel, and I started drinking at the motel. I had to make that bus, and it was after Thanksgiving. I don't know how I made that bus, but I made it. And I got out here, came to Sam's, and I was laying on the couch, and... You know, I got another friend, Cindy and Amy, and all of us have known each other a long time through a chat. And um, Cindy was telling Sam to tell me that she loved me because she had already told everybody else. And she was telling me to tell her because I needed to tell her because she loves me too. And I didn't have the guts to do it. But I'd never met anyone like Sam. I mean, anybody that awake, anybody that real, genuine. I mean, she's a genuine person. She's, what you see is what you get. I mean, I love her with all my heart. But anyway, I made that bus and I got out here and I was on the couch. Like I say, I was going to, try to go to the homeless shelter I didn't know what to do but I knew if I went in the homeless shelter there'd be some kind of program there so I was fixing to leave Cindy was encouraging her and me and finally I decided I will and I told her I love you and she said she loved me too I think it was about eight days later we went and got married And we don't have anything except for love. She has me to lean on. Even if she thinks she doesn't, she does. And I know I have her to lean on. She's proved that. But it kind of scared me at first. Because, you know, I prayed, don't take my mom out of my life until... Until you bring someone in that loves me like her or, you know, just let her stay in my life till the rapture. 
Well, Sam loved me way more than her. I've never been loved like this before. I've never experienced this before. I didn't know what this feels like. And I don't know, even know how to deal with it now. I'm not good at being responsive with it because I've never experienced this, not even from family. I get the discovery for the charges. My lawyer finally sent me two years later. And I read what was written. It found out the next day the chief of police come to interview my mom to ask her questions. That's where the felony intimidation come from. My mom said that she was having financial problems because I was addicted. That's where it comes from. Intimidation. <laughs> That's intimidation. A felony, five years probation. All kinds of classes, 80 hours community service. Mental health evaluation. Lose all my rights. Lose my Fourth Amendment, Fourth Amendment rights completely. Can't vote, but I wasn't going to vote anyway. Can't carry a gun, but I'd already lost that anyway through another charge. But anyway, I woke up one morning here at Sam's after we got married and I didn't have that obsession I wasn't thinking about alcohol that hadn't happened in like 17 no that was sorry not 17 15 years I had never had that happen and the next day the same thing happened and the next day the same thing happened and now two years later I still haven't drank and I still haven't wanted to drink. How could that happen if God didn't do it? Tell me. Because I was a homeless drunk. I was the one laying on the park bench. I was the one sleeping on the sidewalk. I was the one camping behind Walmart. You tell me who takes that kind of addiction and that kind of alcoholism away. Who does it? Satan wouldn't do that. I have to be doing something right. He took me and put me in another state where I'd never been before. With somebody I'd never met before but knew on messenger but I already loved and she already loved me and neither one of us would tell the other one he completely took it away completely trust in the gospel it's 1 Corinthians 15 1 through 4 Jesus died on the cross for, for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried, and he rose again. He's alive, according to the scriptures. He's coming back any day now. I love y'all. The ones that haven't judged me, that stuck by me, thank you. The ones that have judged me that haven't stuck by me. Oh well. What can I do? People are going to think whatever they want to think. And I can't stop that. But that's the truth of what happened. My mom's hands on the Discovery have bruises all over the back. She was on blood thinners and she bruised when she hits everything. Those come from digging up under me and digging up under the mattress, trying to find alcohol. They're charging me with that, using that as evidence. If I had money for a lawyer, there's no way. My sister wrote her statement and it says that they attacked me. If I had a lawyer, there's no way. But I have a public defender and I have no money. I have to take the plea deal. I have to take the probation. I have to lose all my rights. I have to do all these classes. 
I have to pay $18,000 in fines plus court cost. I'm not capable of doing this. It's going to take Jesus. You know, he moved me here to Arkansas, and that's how I found out I had lung cancer. I've been doing the regimen that I learned, and it hadn't grown in almost a year now. And I'm almost out of the regimen to keep it from growing. So, that tells me we're leaving, because I don't have any way to get more. Well, that tells me we're leaving. I mean... So many people are facing things that just are so hard. Things that are impossible. Like, what's coming up? There's no way I can do this without Jesus. I'm not good on probation. Because probation could make me stop the therapy I'm already in. Which is actually helping. Because I'm not restricted. I'm not in there talking about feelings. You know, I'm actually doing something to work past it, and it's working. It's amazing how well it's working. My depression has gotten so much better. So, so much better. This therapy is working great. But anyway, that's the story of the miracles that proved to me I'm on the right track. All over the Bible, God used men to do His will and attack His people. And then He would turn around and destroy them. Remember the writing on the wall? You know, who come in and destroyed that? Nebuchadnezzar's son, it was... The Assyrians, I believe, if I remember right. But anyway, he always uses men to do prophecy. So if you think, well, they're fulfilling prophecy, they're making it happen. Well, someone has to. God's sovereign. You got to see what's going on on the back end, too. A lot of people don't know. You can, That's the reason I say a lot of watchmen aren't awake. They don't see what's really happening. People are scared to talk about it because they're scared that they would get a curse put upon them. That's the reason it was done. That's the con. That's the deception. These people who are doing it are not real J's. They are the synagogue of Satan. They are the Akhenazi J's. They're basically Illuminati this is happening by the timeline that the majority of people are watching why wouldn't that be what was prophesied who cares who's doing it it's happening look at this country anytime this country's gone anytime they're either going to turn the lights out or they're going to bomb it or both. Something big is coming. All right. I don't know if anyone will watch this to the end. Probably not. Because it's probably not that important. I'm not that important. But I felt led to tell the whole story of the miracles I've experienced. All right. I love y'all. Once again. Talk to you later.